I'm Shachar Razani, and in the news, Israel at war. Following Nazi Hamas slaughter of October 7th, 2023, which left around thousands of innocent people butchered, massacred, and maimed, Israel continues to attack Hamas in Gaza and is getting ready for a ground invasion to eradicate Hamas and its leadership. And the international arena is a buzz. A summit in Egypt, the U.S. spearheading support for Israel, and European leaders continue to arrive in Israel, along with what seem to be international efforts to release at least some of the hostages. So what's happening behind the scenes and on the ground, and what should we expect in the weeks and months ahead? Joining us all the way from Israel is our good friend, Chaviv Retigur. Chaviv is an Israeli journalist and a political correspondent and analyst for the Times of Israel. Chaviv, good to have you again with us. How are you? Thank you for having me, Shachar. It's, it's good to be here. So first of all, how are you? How is the family? How are you doing in Israel? We're okay. I mean, we're doing better than many families. We have good friends who uh, who have lost families in the on October 7th. We have friends who have loved ones in Gaza taken hostage, including children. We um, <clears throat> ourselves have um, family who have been called up to frontline combat units. Um, and so, you know, everybody's a little bit... Um, in you know in between footfalls so to speak we're holding our breath my immediate family is okay the main i think challenge for us over the last two weeks has been helping everyone who is who we know who is going through hell you know and and we haven't been you know thank god so so we're okay we're okay the country has come together in astonishing ways we're discovering our strength. You don't want to be put in a position where you discover your strength, but if you are put in that position, it's good to discover your strength. Right. You know, um, you are our go-to expert when it comes to the political dynamics inside Israel and, of course, the global diplomatic map. So let me first ask you, um, in the sense, exactly what you were talking about. We have seen in the last few years incredible, you know, social and political fragmentation within Israel. Um, how within the political system and you know within Israeli society, describe some of the changes that you're seeing as a result of this horrendous situation we're at. Yeah, um, it's you know we're starting with the good news. Um, exactly. I th- I think that we've seen uh, just one example um, is that Hamas declared um, a Friday a week ago. A uh, day of rage, and there was a little bit of rage in world capitals by Hamas supporters, and certainly in Gaza you saw a little bit, um, but in the West, in the West Bank there was almost none. And what's astonishing was that in in among Israeli Arabs, among Palestinian citizens of Israel, not only was there none, but we've seen the opposite. So many Israeli citizens. Who are Arabs whose whose identity is Palestinian um, are so horrified by the Hamas massacre. And also because they live among Israelis, because they speak Hebrew, um, they understand the Israeli experience, which is hard to see from the outside. They understand that the Israeli body politic believes experience that it went through this attempt at peace back in the peace process days, and then this attempt at unilateral withdrawal, and then Right now, you have an Israeli government, a very right-wing Israeli government that most Israeli Arabs uh, oppose vociferously, really intensely. But they also know the history, and they know that what the kind of crimes, the kinds of atrocities that Hamas committed, it committed back in 2000 in the Second Intifada when it blew up morning buses in Israeli cities, which are essentially school buses. And so it, it know, they know that the Israeli experience of Hamas is that Hamas is there not only destroying and murdering and massacring civilians when there's a government that Palestinians feel is bad for them, but and and torpedoing the peace process, you know, make the whole case, make the whole Palestinian case against Israel now, but also at the height of the peace process and under a left-wing government when they're at Camp David negotiating shared sovereignty of the Temple Mount. And so we've seen astonishing scenes of uh, Israeli Arabs coming out and saying, you know, if this is if this is Palestinian politics, Hamas today is the most popular political faction 
among Palestinians than we're Israelis. And that's kind of an extreme end, right? Because that's across the Jewish-Arab divide, which is a very, very painful and complicated divide. Haredim, who were very apart and very divided from you know, mainstream or secular Israeli society, certainly, um, have been volunteering in massive numbers, thousands upon thousands, to um, organizations that went through the the villages that have been just destroyed, massacred, and picking up bodies. And in some burned houses, you're talking about literally scooping up ashes, um, because a lot of the body of a child is 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 just ash. And making sure that that in Jewish tradition you bury the whole body complete. And so there are people who have spent the last two weeks collecting body parts to give that last grace to the dead. And those are Haredim in Haredi organizations like Zaka who have been doing that. And not only that, the army has reported recently, uh, just this week, something like 3,000 people from the Haredi community have asked to join the army, have asked to draft, have volunteered for the draft. And, and they're not going to serve in combat roles. They have religious problems with certain army things, but they can be ambulance drivers. And they want to be ambulance drivers, and they want to be part of that. We have seen a strange thing. There was, you know, it's something everyone has felt, but we finally have a statistic today. The Israel Democracy Institute, it's a think tank in Jerusalem, published a poll um, that showed that optimism is up, optimism is rising among Israelis. Trust in the government is at a twenty-year low, but overall optimism about Israel's future is soaring. And that's because of this new unity. Right-wingers just watched their right-wing government oversee the worst Jewish you know, massacre of Jews since 1945. Left-wingers have basically supported the concept of, of, um, of um, containing Hamas, negotiating with Hamas, buying quiet from Hamas. And they now understand that that concept, well, you, that quiet was being bought on credit, so to speak. In the end, we had when the bill came due, it was too too painful to bear. Everybody in Israel today, uh, just about everybody, feels that they got this wrong. Um, the left wingers, the the you know the the parts of the of the judicial reform protest movement, um, like uh, comrades at arms, Achim Lanishik, who right. called for Israelis not to serve. Within three hours of the start of the massacre, and long before the Israeli government or Benjamin Netanyahu spoke to the people, they put out a statement saying everybody goes to serve. And they have been one of the great organizers of a civil society response that has found homes for people who had to flee their homes or their homes were burned down, that has helped um, uh, you know people who want to volunteer for the reserves to volunteer. And so the the left turns out to be more patriotic than the right ever admitted. Um, the right turns, turns out to have been wrong about some of its most basic sort of security ideas and concepts. Everybody is a lot more humble. And there's a new unity that I think we all feel. And by the way, it's not just at the grand political level. Um, my neighbors, just my, my just my ordinary neighbors, I have a brother-in-law who's, uh, who's in the army in a combat unit, and his wife is eight months pregnant. And she was living in a house in a, you know, town... Uh, near Tel Aviv, central Israel, and um, she, they don't, they were new in that town, and she doesn't have anyone to help her. So she wanted to move over to us and be with us for the duration of the war, which could be three, four, five months. Who knows? And our neighbors have a kid in an upstairs apartment with their own bathroom. A teenager leave their room, move in with the, uh, you know, sibling, and freed up that basically suite for her because an eight-month pregnant woman whose husband is off at the war shouldn't have to worry and shouldn't have to you know think twice about and so she lives now with us and our neighbors have been there every step of the way and we've been there for them and it's 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 the experience of every single israeli this society has come together in a way none of us remember it's incredible to listen to you um, share this, Haviv. Um, I want to ask, you mentioned um, Hamas's popularity among Palestinians. From your perspective, um, bearing in mind the horrible atrocities of this terrible massacre and slaughter conducted in such a cruel, I wouldn't even say inhumane because it's so much worse than that. Um, how is that perceived by Palestinians from your perspective? Is Hamas more popular today 
or have they have their deeds put them to some sort of shame in in any way? It's complicated. Um, my sense is that it's complicated because we're getting signals in all directions. There is there was initially um, enormous celebration. And um, again, just because the celebration is loud and public and um, obvious doesn't mean it's widespread. But uh, we have polls. We have polls by Palestinian pollsters uh, that tell us that uh, support for terror attacks against civilians is a majority opinion among Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. And now that Hamas is now that the, the the reality of Hamas's actions, the way they behaved, has come out. There's also a tremendous blowback in Palestinian society, not against Hamas itself, not against the idea of terrorism, but against the the radical cruelty of it, against the murdering of children in front of their parents, videotaping it and sending it, you know, to the family on on Facebook from the kids' phone, things like that, uh, feel like Islamic State or as it's called in Arabic, Daesh, right? And the whole argument now among Palestinians in which Israeli Arabs, by the way, have participated, is maybe Hamas is Daesh. Nobody wants to live under Daesh. That's that's already that's already sickening. That's there's nothing Muslim about that. And so Hamas has gone t- for many Palestinians over the edge. And the second piece to that is it has brought on Gaza an Israeli response that is immense and is causing tremendous suffering for Palestinians. But I think that what Gazans understand and what Palestinians everywhere understand is that Gaza's suffering isn't just this war. There is a war to, you know, to hunt down Hamas in Gaza. It is, you know, when the Americans and the Iraqis and the Kurdish forces uh, surrounded Mosul in 2016, they besieged Mosul. The uh, Islamic State fighters in the city, it's a city of a million people, Islamic State fighters in the city wouldn't let civilians leave. And so the Americans provided the air assault and on the ground were the Iraqi forces and the Kurdish forces. And that city, probably 11,000 civilians were killed. Uh, They went literally street by street, building by building, and they decimated and destroyed and expelled Islamic State. Israel is thinking in those terms. Incidentally, when the Americans and the Iraqis and the Iraqi Kurds do it, of course, it's legal under international law. <clears throat> now it's, of course, not legal under international law for some reason. But Israel's thinking in those terms. And Palestinians know that and are going to feel it. And they are already feeling it. And that is now being attached to Hamas. And people want to ask Hamas really terrible questions. But Hamas is, of course, a dictatorship. So they don't. But it gets it gets even worse. This, this Israeli government has already passed the decision that Gaza is forever detached from Israel. There is a fear among Egyptians. They won't take Gazan refugees. Um, what do you mean it's safe... the decision that Gaza is forever detached from Israel? Explain that a bit. Yeah, uh, we've seen now how the Jordanians and the Egyptians said we won't take any refugees from Gaza. And the fear is that Palestinians will be pushed out and Israel will claim Gaza. And there's already a couple of ministers from the far right in this government who said, let's resettle Gaza, right? Um, the actual Israeli response is the opposite. We clean Hamas out of Gaza, we get out of Gaza, we institute some other kind of political framework, maybe give it to the Palestinian Authority, you know, nobody's quite clear on that yet. And from that day forth, no Gazan will ever work in Israel. No electricity will come in from Israel, no water will come in from Israel, that's a closed enemy border. And Gaza, best of luck to you, do whatever you can do anywhere else in the world, good luck with all the help. That is the permanent decimation of Gaza. Because even if Gaza is rebuilt with aid money, the the most prosperous economy by far, with the highest wages by far, and the people who will come to want to invest in Gaza massively, and they're right there. You know, before the second intifada in 2000, my uncle was the CFO of a textile firm, and they had uh, clothing stores in all the Israeli malls, uh, a brand called Jump, for example. I don't know if uh, any Israelis watching us will remember. Um, all their all their stitching was done in Gaza. Oh, wow. And then the terrorism came, and they had to leave Gaza, and they moved to Jordan. The Israeli economy can be Gaza's great you know, wave of economic prosperity, can bring that in. Palestinian integration 
you know, in a two-state solution, you know, never mind the political solution, but just economically integration into Israel is the only prosperous future the Palestinians have. Otherwise, they're going to look like Egypt at best and potentially Somalia. That is no longer part of the Palestinian future in Gaza. That, that government decision, that was, you know, there will not be any Palestinian worker coming in from Gaza anymore. Um, is 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 another piece that Hamas now has to explain to the Palestinian people. Wow, Haviv, um, this is, you know, so far-reaching. You know, what you're talking about are the long-term ramifications. You help us pause for a minute and understand what everything that transpired in the past two weeks actually means on the ground. Even the perception of a two-state solution in the eyes and minds and hearts of so many Israelis, that also has fundamentally changed, hasn't it, as far as understanding what should be the, you know, security versus civilian equation there? Yeah, I I mean, let's leave aside for the moment in this conversation the Israeli political right. Right. The Israeli political right never trusted the Oslo process to the Israeli religious right, certainly. Not all the right is religious, but to that religious right, the, the mountains of the West Bank of Judea and Samaria and Benjamin and and uh, these are you know these are literally the mountains of the Bible. I mean the entire Bible happened in the West Bank. None of the Bible happened in Tel Aviv, right? It's probably why Tel Aviv is you know so much more fun. But the point is not that. The point is that um, this is this is a homeland. This is an ideological principle. But to the Israeli left. Uh, a willing, there was a willingness to pull out of the West Bank, and it was even an eagerness. It was even a kind of civic religion in the 90s. We needed to pull out because we needed to separate, because otherwise we're going to rule over millions of people. We don't want to become Israeli, and we and they don't want to become Israeli. The only thing we all agree on is that they should not be Israeli, so we need to pull out of the West Bank. To that Israeli left, there was only one condition that had to exist for the pullout to happen from the West Bank. The West Bank is 16 times the size of Gaza. The West Bank is the mountainous ridge overlooking all our major population centers. You, with a with a, a, a weapon you can carry on your shoulder, like an 81 millimeter mortar, for example, you can fire from anywhere in the West Bank and hit all of Israel's cities, shut down all of Israel's major, certainly the entire Tel Aviv area, shut down our major international airport. Um, the West Bank is too dangerous to allow it to go the way that South Lebanon went when we pulled down in 2000 or the way that Gaza went when we pulled down in 2005. And so to the Israeli left that wants separation, that wants a Palestinian state, that wants to pull out of the West Bank, the idea that Hamas has essentially demolished it. Every square inch that Israel withdraws from, Hamas fills that gap. Hamas fills that vacuum. And Hamas, you know, this operation but at a scale of the West Bank, would would have killed 15,000 Israelis. We, we'd be counting thousands of dead children, kidnapped hundreds of children. I mean, what are we, t- you know, that's what Hezbollah, by the way, has prepared. It, has, it boasts of having, you know, it, it has published footage of it training to take over Israeli towns in exactly the way that Hamas did on October 7th. And so I, I don't know not how the Israeli right pulls out of the West Bank. That's a political, basically civil war internal to Israel that, you know, how does the Israeli left pull out of the West Bank? There is a the damage to the Palestinian cause. It's not even just limited to the Israeli left is scared. It gets much bigger than that because the international campaign for the Palestinians, uh, sometimes it's a boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign. Sometimes it's just ordinary, decent people joining marches because they don't know any other way to help Palestinians. But their whole argument, their entire strategy is that they can pressure Israel, they can raise the cost of Israel's current policies, and then Israel will change those policies. If the cost exceeds the perceived benefit, Israel will change the policy. Well, Hamas is making sure that the perceived benefit is that our children aren't dying. Hamas is making sure that we understand that every inch of land we give up turns into a massacre of our children. From, from the Second Tifat in 2000 to the massacre of October 7th, Hamas has neutralized the pro-Palestinian campaign in Israeli politics and in the Israeli psyche. Not the Israeli right, not Netanyahu, not the far right, not settlements. Hamas has destroyed the capacity 
of anyone else to help Palestinians by in any way influencing Israeli politics. And so, you know, this is, we're going to, it's going to be a generation before even Palestinians are capable of developing a strategy that tries to compensate for the damage that Hamas has just done in, in the Israeli ability, capacity, um, to to separate into two states or or to have any kind of of, of solution. It's going to be a generation. Haviv, what do you think um, about the Israeli war against Hamas in Gaza? Do you see the Israeli threat to go into Gaza and eradicate Hamas as a real intention? Because we're already hearing whispers as if Prime Minister Netanyahu is not interested in ground incursion, Perhaps uh, the Israeli government will settle for an air campaign. What do you see? I, I think that Netanyahu went into this um, with a huge trust deficit. And um, the judicial reform was an idea that was supported by something like 70% of Israelis. And by the time his government was done presenting such a radical version and framing it by their own words as as this radical assault on Israeli democracy, um, it had uh, something like 25% support. Um, and so th- this was an immense shedding of political capital. And we saw Netanyahu, who, who got about 50% of the vote, 49.9% of the vote, something like that on election day, um, but was polling at, you know, 54%, something like that for after the judicial reform was presented and for those eight months. Uh, it's now down in the 40s uh, after this assault. And so Netanyahu goes into this immense event with a trust deficit and every single thing he has done, I have to say, I hate to say it, I hate to even discuss politics right now. Almost everything he has done has um, has made it worse for him, for his political position. For example, he hasn't given a... a Press press conference or answered questions at a press conference uh, since 2021 in Hebrew to an Israeli interviewer who isn't Channel 14, which is sort of the Israeli pro Netanyahu. You know, they cl- you know slap him on the back. They love him. They have never asked him a difficult question. They really are a, a, su- deeply supportive of him. There's one channel like that. It's a legitimate voice. But he has not interviewed to anyone else since 2021, and he hasn't interviewed now. He's not answering questions Israelis are asking, ordinary Israelis. He's, you know, he he tried to meet a bunch of reservist soldiers, and one reservist started protesting. One single reservist started yelling something, and Netanyahu walked off the stage and never gave a speech. And since then, he's only met um, draftees of the standing army, you know, 18 to 21 year olds. Who are not legally allowed to express their political opinions to him, as opposed to reservists who are just citizens who are in for for the two weeks, right? So Netanyahu has essentially been in hiding, and um, and 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 every rumor we've heard, every leak from every Likud minister shows him still campaigning. He doesn't understand. He appears to not understand the scale of of the problem. In the first five days after the massacre, a lot of people started demanding a unity emergency government. Right. Um, and Netanyahu's wife, Sarah, who is his most trusted political advisor, sent SMSs to Likud ministers telling them we can't let you know Benny Gantz into the government because then he'll be able to topple us if he leaves. And those ministers were so horrified, those Likud ministers were so horrified that they leaked it to us journalists. And then on day four after this massacre, Likud was forced to put out a statement from the official political party spokespeople that the prime minister's wife does, says that it is now time for a unity government, which was even more damaging because Israelis are asking, why is he, who, why is the wife of the prime minister? He's not going to have. He's waiting for her permission. What is even happening? More importantly, what, where is the question? Of course, we need an emergency government, right? And the next day, um, because he was reeling from the public blowback from that, um, he agreed to that emergency government. So Netanyahu, everything that Israelis are watching now in the Gaza, um, in the Gaza theater, so to speak, the soldiers. We 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 had a call up of something like three hundred sixty thousand soldiers. That's the biggest call up in the history of the IDF, and they've been standing there for two weeks. If the prime minister had basic trust from a majority of the public, then that's fine. 
The Air Force is doing what it needs to do. We know there's an army of 30, 40,000 Hamas fighters buried underground. We know that they're buried for the long haul. Gaza's hospitals are running out of fuel. They're running out of electricity. There is massive months worth of fuel and generators in those bunkers and tunnels that Hamas has under the civilian population. Um, and so the army needs two weeks, three weeks, maybe it needs three months to prepare properly to go to that war. You know what? Go for it. That's fine. Because there's a basic public trust. I think Netanyahu has done everything possible. And I'm not talking about people who don't like him. He's done everything possible for his own people. If you go to Hebrew language Twitter right now, you're talking about Netanyahu's loudest, most passionate supporters looking at all these leaks, looking at this massacre, looking at this army not moving, and just not trusting anymore. And so because it's through that lens, um, it's very hard to tell. My sense is that um, the army has used this time incredibly well. We know for a fact that the army has done massive amount of training. Uh, it had to throw out a lot of the plans it had, right? Most of the army's plans for Gaza were essentially small operations, and then we all go back to the same basic quiet because Hamas is contained, etc. We remember. But we discovered Hamas is not is not deterred and not contained, and therefore we now need completely new plans. And it's not clear the army even had those plans. And so they're drawing those plans up. They're preparing the forces to do the things that will need to be done. This takes time. I don't think that... Netanyahu is scared. I don't think Netanyahu is stuck. I don't think he's the obstacle. Uh, and I say that because everyone else around him um, is very, seems to me, and when I do get a chance to ask someone, then they, this is always their response, very satisfied with how things are progressing, even people who are not on Netanyahu's party or appointed by him. Um, but the public doesn't share that view. And Netanyahu is starting to lose ground in the public and lose trust. Um, and so, you know, I guess my answer is really complicated and long, and I apologize for that. But there is this Israeli worry that we're standing on the gates of Gaza and we're going to miss the opportunity to do what has to be done with Hamas. This public is giving this government infinite, infinite credit to do what needs to be done. Right. And that's the demand coming out of so many that this... Yeah dealt with once and for all, right? Demand that we've been accustomed to hearing from the people in the South during the, you know, the rounds that we experienced in the past. But now, especially in light of this massacre, it, it's unequivocal, right? The desire to not see yes, yes. as a violent and it's in Yow's, order. Right, and it's in Yow's return to power in 2009, 14 I, years ago. His really? campaign was... Netanyahu is going to destroy Hamas in Gaza. And 14 years later, we know that, that was the, his policy was the opposite of his campaigns. And and it ended in in horrific uh, horrific uh, you know massacre. So so Netanyahu, I think I think this w I think there will be a ground invasion. I don't know when. I don't know if it'll delay long enough for the for the northern border for the Hezbollah front to essentially turn into a war, and then maybe Gaza will be delayed because of that. I I don't know those details, but it's a very fluid situation. But I can't imagine the Israelis that this government or any government, if this government doesn't deliver a crushing blow to Hamas, then this government will be replaced. And there'll be a government that will, because the Israeli public won't stand for anything less. Aviv, I have to tell you that I myself would listen to you for many, many more hours. I want to really thank you. I'm sorry our time is so short. I'm, I'm looking forward to having you again soon. But I think all of us are so much all the wiser listening to your insights. Thank you for, for sharing them with us and for your hard work for Israel at this time. Your thoughtful analysis is absolutely incredible. I look forward to speaking to you again. Most importantly, stay safe. You and your family, we're sending you many hugs and best wishes. Just know that all of us here are with you and with the people of Israel during these dire times. Thank you. Thank you, Shecha. And to all of your viewers, I'm sure you enjoyed it just as much as I did listening and being um, so much more, you know, understanding and insightful about what's happening in Israel. And if you're not following Khaviv already on Twitter and reading him on the Times of Israel and beyond, please do. I assure you, you will all benefit from his immense knowledge and wisdom. 
And I would like also to say to our viewers, we here at JBS will continue to keep you updated as things move forward in Israel, which is always important to remind and remember, as we always say, it's not just about Israel and Hamas. This has great moral strategic meanings for Israel and for the world entire as civilization stands to fight barbarism. May we all see better days soon. I'm Shahar Razani. Thank you all for watching. And I'm Israel Chai.